Cool. Uh, all right. So, uh, welcome to our talk, everyone. Uh, we we know it's in the uh, last section of the day, so we're between you and the uh, booth crawl. And um, yeah, I don't know. Appreciate you, everyone, coming by. Um, so, yes. Uh, welcome to whose packet is it, anyways? Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, my name is Doug Jordan, and I work at Airbnb on our Istio-based service mesh called AirMesh. I focus on extending the mesh to virtual machine-based workloads, TCP, and other ingress use cases. Previously, at Microsoft, I worked on our bare metal control plane, where we adopted Linkerd. My handle on GitHub, Twitter, and other socials is usually DWJ300. And as you can see from the photo on the right, I enjoy cycling, climbing mountains, and here's a photo of me doing both of those. Uh, yeah, so my name is Kevin Limekuller. Uh, I am a software engineer at Buoyant, the uh, creators of Linkerd. Um, I've been working there four years now and have worked on all the control plane co components as well as the proxy. Uh, my social handle on GitHub and Twitter is klimekuller. Uh, you can also reach me on the Linkerd Slack um, for any questions you may have after the talk or in watching this recording. Thanks, Kevin. Here's a quick agenda of what we'll be talking about today. First, Kevin will walk us through the how, specifically how a TCP packet gets routed through the mesh. Then, I'll discuss TCP debugging and walk you through a real-world example, breaking out TCP dump and Wireshark. Cool. Uh, so we'd like to start out with an overview on how a packet is routed in a service mesh. Uh, so the things that we cover here will help lay the foundation uh, for understanding some of the debugging steps Doug will take us through later. I'd also like to call out that we're going to uh, try to keep this as service mesh generic as possible. Um, while both Doug and I have had a lot of experience with Istio and Linkerd, uh, the concepts we talk about today are generally shared between the two, as well as some other service meshes. So this talk is ultimately about debugging traffic in a cluster with a service mesh. Uh, so just want to make sure that we're on the same page about what a service mesh is and the common architecture of one that we uh, or you may be debugging. So a mesh provides key properties. Today, uh, those tend to be the four listed here. Um, observability for things like logs and metrics. Uh, routing, things like traffic splitting and endpoint discovery. Security, think MTLS and authorization policies. And reliability, uh, for example, transparent retries of HTTP requests, circuit breaking, things like that. In order to provide these features, uh, the service mesh needs to intercept traffic into and out of the pod. Uh, so how do we achieve this? So this leads us to the service mess architecture. Uh, here we see the sidecar proxy model. Uh, this is the model that most uh, meshes follow these days. Uh, it's worth noting because uh, some, mes some meshes, uh, including the previous Linkerd version, ran a proxy per node. Uh, in the sidecar proxy model, uh, each pod gets its own proxy container. Inbound and outbound traffic can be redirected through this container, which is how some of those features I just discussed are implemented. Uh, multiple pods uh, may be injected across multiple nodes, and the grouping of all injected pods makes up what we call the data plane. The second part to the sidecar proxy model is the control plane. In Linkerd, uh, this consists of the components that inform each of the proxies in the data plane. Uh, it probably has a destination component used for routing decisions, an identity component used for assigning TLS identities to the proxies, and a policy component for determining who can talk to who. Uh, depending on the mesh, there may be different components. So the sidecar proxy model injects a proxy container into each pod. Uh, somehow, inbound and outbound traffic from the other containers end up going through that proxy. Um, so in order to understand how that's happening, uh, let's take a look at what a container actually is. Uh, 
So the first thing to know is that Linux doesn't actually have containers. It has namespaces. Uh, namespaces partition the kernel resources such that different sets of processes see different sets of resources. This means that each process or a group of processes is associated with a namespace and can only see the resources within it. The isolated resources uh, depend on the namespace and we'll see what some of those are next. So here we see that by using namespaces, we can create a pod with multiple containers. The blue boxes represent containers within the red bordered box, the pod. The red bordered box represents a single network namespace. Uh, there can be multiple network namespaces on a host, which is how we end up with multiple pods on a node. Looking at the blue boxes, uh, each process ID is associated with a network namespace um, with a network namespace and can be a container. Each of those process IDs can be associated with, for example, a separate mount namespace so that they see their own file system. So now that we have a uh, idea about like a higher level uh, representation of a container and a pod in Linux, uh, we're gonna build one up from scratch and focus on the parts important for routing a packet. So first we start off with a host, uh, which refer, refer, we are uh, referring to as a node. And next we create a network namespace on the host. Uh, you'll recognize the red border box from the previous slides. Again, this virtualizes the network resources so that processes using this namespace only see those network resources, uh, not the ones on the host or other network namespaces. Upon creation, we have the loopback interface uh, for local traffic, as well as a virtualized ETH0 interface for traffic into and out of the pod. Additionally, we have a private set of IP addresses, a routing table, a socket listing, um, connection tracking table, firewall, uh, all the network related resources. Then uh, each container we create is a process that shares this view of the network resources. You'll recognize the blue boxes uh, from the previous slides. And finally, uh, we return to the fact that we can create multiple network namespaces on a single host and end up with multiple pods on the node. Uh, I want to reinforce the idea that each network namespace has its own view of network resources. Uh, this is highlighted by the fact that here we have four containers running, uh, two of which bind to port 8080 and two of which bind to port 3306. Uh, these bindings don't conflict because they take place on separate pods, which means that they're in se separate network namespaces. Um, each pod is then also given an, IP, uh, given an IP address that is reachable from other pods. So in the last few sides, uh, we've seen that within each network namespace, I've been highlighting two uh, specific resources with green boxes, IP tables and sockets. Um, so why are IP tables important for this talk? Uh, so, well, since IP tables are unique to the network namespace, uh, we know that all containers within that namespace observe the same IP tables configuration. So they are responsible for the redirection of certain packets to the sidecar proxy before arriving at an, at an application container or leaving the pod. So if a packet matches any of the configured rules, they reroute that packet so that it is redirected to the proxy container. But how are they actually doing this? So here we get um, into the fact that every IP packet has a header and we can see what that looks like here. Um, a packet header is the part of a packet that precedes its body. Uh, each row that we're looking at is a 32-bit word that encodes all sorts of addressing information for that packet. Uh, this can include things like the total length of the header and data, uh, packet identifier, and most importantly for this talk, the source and the destination. I've highlighted the destination address with the red box uh, because this is the field in the packet header that IP tables is rewriting. Uh, 
um, IP tables has determined based off some piece of information, say in this case the destination, that this packet matches a rule uh, that it is responsible for rewriting um, the destination to a different one, uh, the, the proxy in this case. So returning back to this picture, um, we can see now that instead of going directly to the original destination, uh, inbound and outbound traffic first passes through the proxy container. Um, so inbound ends outbound traffic. Uh, we have to consider the fact that the proxy will have different behavior depending on the direction of traffic. Uh, so therefore, the proxy will actually bind um, a separate port for each direction. So here, uh, the proxy container is going to bind uh, port 4143 uh, for inbound traffic and port 4140 for outbound traffic. Um, IP tables will have separate rules that rewrite the destination address fields to, um, to these ports depending on the direction of the packet. Also note that these ports are not arbitrarily chosen. These are the actual ports that we use in Linkerd, for example. So this is great. Uh, IP tables have done their job and the proxy container is now receiving traffic. We have another issue though. Uh, remember that the packet's destination addresses were rewritten. So even though the proxy is now receiving its traffic, uh, it still needs to ensure that it all ends up at the originally intended destinations. This is where the other network resource I've been highlighting in previous slides comes into play, uh, socket tables. So when a connection is opened, we can examine the listing in socket tables that corresponds to that connection. Of the things tracked in each listing, the one that we care about here is the original destination for that connection. The proxy calls into libc and uh, the get sock opt function and gets the original destination for that socket. Using that, we ensure that the traffic is going to the pre-IP tables destination. I've been talking about IP tables having rules that match traffic uh, the mesh cares about and ensuring that destinations are rewritten. Uh, the presence of these rules are also a responsibility of the mesh, and there are a few ways that these can be added to the pod. The most common way to handle this is using an init container. Uh, an init container runs before any of the pod's application containers start. The mesh is responsible for injecting this in the container, uh, similar to how it's uh, responsible for injecting the proxy container. Uh, the init container will run to completion and add the necessary rules to IP tables for that pod. Uh, if we're just adding rules though, why do we need a separate container? Uh, so rewriting IP tables requires elevated permissions, a problem that Doug will uh, cover in his side of the talk. Uh, and we don't want to give the long running proxy elevated permissions for something that really is only going to happen when the container starts. Uh, so an init container helps solve this by uh, separating the need for uh, permissions between containers. So the init container is run and the application containers have started and now they observe the IP tables configuration required for the service mesh. Uh, so therefore, traffic that we care about uh, is redirected to the proxy container. So another way to solve this issue is to use a CNI plugin. Uh, without getting into the details on this, it ensures that each pod has properly configured IP tables. Uh, one of my coworkers, Alex, gave a talk yesterday at Service MeshCon about how Linkerd's CNI plugin is implemented. Um, if you're interested in that, I would definitely recommend checking out the recording on that. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Now that we understand a bit more about how packets actually flow through a service mesh, I'm going to walk through how to debug a real TCP stream. I encountered the need to capture TCP packets when debugging an issue with our Istio-based service mesh at Airbnb called AirMesh, specifically within our custom metadata exchange. For this talk, we're going to rely on a few key assumptions. Note that they aren't requirements per se, but they will make talking about and visualizing the underlying networking model much simpler. First, 
is that you're using a CNI, Container Networking Interface, such that each pod has a unique IP address from the, directly from the VPC that's routable from other pods on the network. For instance, the AWS VPC CNI. Second, we use, we'll be using the cryo container runtime, but all the commands shown, commands shown today could easily be modified for container D. Last, and probably most importantly, having SSH specifically root access to the nodes. We'll discuss how to avoid this requirement at the end of the talk. The use case that brought about this debugging involved talking to Apache Kafka, so I'd like to start with some quick context about what Kafka is and a little bit about how it works for those who may be unfamiliar. Kafka is a distributed messaging queue. At a very basic level, a client can either produce a message to a topic or consume one. Internally, Kafka consists of brokers, which are just instances of the service, topics, which are like categories or feeds, and partitions, which are, well, you know, partitions of the data within a topic. Kafka uses Zookeeper to run leader election at the partition level, so every partition will only have one leader, shown here on the slide in green. When a producer wants to send a message to a topic, it'll first compute the partition ID, often using a consistent hash function. Then, it will use its internal metadata of the cluster state to write that message to a broker that contains the leader of that partition. When a consumer consumes that message, it's actually pulling the Kafka broker for recent messages on that particular partition. Now that we know a bit more about Kafka, we need to explain where our service mesh fits into the picture to help us trace some packets. In order to send producer consume requests, Kafka client, Kafka's client first needs to discover the initial state of the world, i.e. all the brokers, topics, and partitions. To do this, it uses a special request called metadata request. This request happens on client initialization and can be routed to any broker in the cluster as they all share the same view of the world thanks to Zookeeper. Once the clients have this information, it will then route requests to specific brokers on, based on topics in our case, we'll use our service mesh for that initial metadata request because we don't actually care which broker responds to it, and we just want to route it to a healthy node, something that the service mesh is really good at. After that, all subsequent publish or consume requests will go directly to the specific brokers, thus skipping the service mesh entirely. This is because Kafka's client wants to be in control of exactly which broker it's talking to, as it knows the internal mapping of partitions to topics. The issue we encountered was during this initial metadata request. So in order to reproduce the issue, let's use Kafka Cat. Kafka Cat is a CLI used to talk to Kafka and is incredibly useful when you don't want to spin up a heavyweight JVM just to check the state of the cluster. Here, we'll use kubectl exec to, exec to run a command in a pod, in this case, a pod called pod test against our app container. We'll specify the following arguments to Kafka Cat minus L for metadata listing, and then minus B to specify the broker we want to talk to. In this case, it will be the address of our um, Istio service or our uh, service mesh service called Kafka.service on port 9092, which is Kafka's default TCP listening port. And we get this error, right? Fatal error at some line of metadata list, um, broker transport failure. What does that mean? Well, after a bunch of Googling and lots of code spelunking through Kafka's code base, all I can find out is that the request is malformed. But what does that tell me? Isn't our service mesh supposed to give us all this rich observability? Well, yes and no. For HTTP, the telemetry emitted by service mesh is incredibly useful. We have response codes, logs, and even response flags in the case of Envoy. As shown on this slide, there's 25 unique flags for HTTP requests that are emitted in the logs when things go wrong. But for TCP connections, we only have seven flags that are extremely generic. Without response codes or detailed response flags, it can be really difficult to find the exact cause of some of these issues. So what do we do? We break out our favorite tool, TCP dump, and then look at packet captures in Wireshark. But how do we do this in the context of Kubernetes, specifically Kubernetes with a service mesh? 
We're going to take a look at two different packet captures. The first one is what the client, Kafka Cat, is actually seeing. And the second one is what the proxy is seeing. As Kevin explained earlier, all the containers in a pod share a same single network namespace. So they use IP tables to rewrite packets destined for meshed services to the proxy's inbound port on the loopback interface. So to capture what Kafka Cat is actually seeing, we can just TCP dump on that loopback interface. Once we have that capture, we can take a second one, this time to see what the sidecar proxy sees by running TCP dump against the host on a virtual interface for the pod. We'll talk more about that later. Let's start out simple. We'll just run TCP dump in the main container. We'll run kube control exec against our pod, same one, pod test, and we'll run it against our application container, in this case, app. And we get another error executable file not found in path. Well, that's obvious, right? We don't include TCP dump in our container images. We do this for a variety of reasons. Hopefully these are kind of obvious, but things like we run distroless images, we want a minimal security footprint, and in general, we don't include debugging utilities in our images so that we can reduce our security surface. So let's just install it, right? If it's a VM, just apt update, apt install, and call it a day. But it's not that simple. Doing this in Kubernetes at runtime in the container would require both root and a package manager. So it's probably just easier to bake it into the image at build time. In order to bring in extra dependencies to our main container image, we've gone ahead and modified our deployment spec to run an additional sidecar container. We'll use the NetShoot image, which already has TCP dump installed. As a reminder, all containers share that single network namespace, so we can just run TCP dump in any of those sidecar containers to capture traffic on the loopback interface and observe everything that's going on in the pod. But again, it still doesn't work. You don't have permission to capture on that device. What gives? Hmm. Turns out, it's because we're running our containers as non-root users. Using non-privileged containers is becoming more and more common. And to be clear, this is a good thing. But how do we capture on an interface without it? Well, we have two options. We could add net admin and net raw security capabilities to our pod security context, but that would be less secure and doesn't really help with the just-in-time access model. If we only need temporary access, this would be too heavy-handed. Alternatively, if we have or can get pseudo SSH access to the nodes, we can take a packet capture directly from there. So let's go do that. Okay, but how do we actually do that? Many of you folks know how to do this, but as a reminder, we first are gonna to need to get the node name from the pod object. We'll run kube control get pod and specify the, this JSON path to get the node name. In this case, the pod that we're trying to look at is running on node one, okay? Now that we know the node's name, let's get its IP address. We we'll use kube control get node with node one and then this JSON path to get its internal IP address. And note that in our situation, we wanna get the internal IP address because it's accessible on our corporate VPN as opposed to say maybe a public IP address, which may not be. While we're here, oh, sorry. And the, the node is running internally on our 192.168.1.9 network. So let's use that. While we're here, we're also gonna grab the container ID, and I'll explain why we need that in a second. This can be any container in the pod, but since we know we have our sidecar proxy injected, we'll just use that one. So we'll run kube control get pod, and pass this to JQ, look at the container statuses, and finally select the one whose name is proxy, and then get its container ID. It's kind of a long command. And we see our container ID is cryo colon slash slash, 94AD dot dot dot, which makes sense, right? We're using cryo. Then lastly, let's SSH to that internal IP. Awesome. As Kevin mentioned earlier, each pod has unique net NS. So in order to run TCP dump within it, we need to first find it. Now that we're on the node and have the container ID, we can get the network namespace by using CRICTL, which is the CLI used to talk to the cryo container runtime. So we'll run cryo inspect on the container ID and specifically 
select the namespace of type network's path using JQ. Note this namespaces slice has all of the namespaces, not just network, right? The mount, the PID, the user, et cetera. But we'll get the network namespace. In this case, it looks like var run ns and then 149, some long GUID. Now that we have this network namespace, let's run a quick sanity check. If we run if config from inside this container's network namespace, it should see the same IP as the pod's IP, right? Because ultimately, it is the pod. So our pod's running on 100.116.95.102. So we'll see if we can see that same IP address. To run a process inside a particular namespace of any type, not just network, we can use the nsenter command. So here, we'll run nsenter with the minus minus net argument and specify our network namespace, that var run ns and then some long good. And look, if we look at the output, we see the inet address of 100.116.95.102, which is our pod's IP address. So we know we're on the right path. Now that we've found and verified the network namespace, we can finally run TCP dump, the moment we've always been waiting for. Again, we'll use nsenter to enter the network namespace and run TCP dump with the following options. Minus I for loopback, because again, we want to capture the traffic between the application container, Kafka Cat, and the proxy. We'll use S0 to capture all packet sizes. We'll use NN to not resolve port or host names. And lastly, we'll use minus W, capture.pcap, to write it to a file. Pretty standard. With this TCP dump, we can actually open a Wireshark. So here it is, and we're going to look for something very specific. We want to make sure we observe this metadata exchange. I don't have time to go into the full wire protocol of Kafka, nor do I fully understand it, but if you, we look at the first packet after the standard TCP handshake, number 137, we can see the client ID in the body's plain text, RD Kafka. This is the default client ID set by libRD Kafka, which is the underlying library that KafkaCAD is using. Note that the reason we can actually see this body in plain text is because the capture is taken between the proxy and the application. Next, we'll look at capturing data from the external side of the proxy. So if we want to observe the external traffic, which is encrypted between pods, we can use, excuse me, uh, we need to know which interface to listen on if we want to avoid getting hit by a fire hose of packets, i.e. we could capture everything on the host, but it would be pretty hard to find the signal in the noise. Since we're using the VPC CNI, there is a route on the host's routing table for each pod IP to the virtual interface created for that pod. So we can use IP route show to look at the host's routing table and just grep for the pod IP. As we can see, the route for our pod's IP address, the one ending in .102, is using the virtual interface ENI blah 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 ending in 097. Using that, we can finally run TCP dump on the host to capture traffic outside the proxy. This is again traffic that's transiting the pod's boundary. We we'll use the same TCP dump command as before, except this time we'll listen on this interface instead of loopback, and we won't run it inside the network namespace. So we run just vanilla TCP dump minus I with the ENI, the virtual interface, ending in 097, and this other, the rest of the options are the same as before. As you can see, we've captured 579 packets. I won't open this PCAP up now, as the traffic is encrypted using the proxy's TOS certificate and won't be very useful to us. I'll leave it as an exercise for the attendee to figure out how to get the certificate needed to decrypt this traffic. Spoiler, you can use the debug port of your proxy. After going through all these hoops and hurdles just to take a simple packet capture, there must be a better way. And the good news is, there is. Ephemeral containers are a relatively new feature of Kubernetes that allow launching a new container that shares some of the Linux namespaces of the running pod. In our case, we want to share the network namespace, which is done by default. There is one major limitation, however. They currently do not support changing the security context of a running pod. So if you launch a pod with a restrictive security policy, 
that prevents net raw or net admin, you still can't use ephemeral containers to run TCP dump. But for argument's sake, let's say we don't have that restrictive security policy. How would we use ephemeral containers, assuming the security context allowed it? Well, the kube control debug command will attach a new container to the running pod using a provided image. So we can just run kube control debug pod against our pod, again, pod test, and pass in a custom image. In this case, we'll use netshoot again, as we know it has TCP dump installed. Same arguments apply as before, and we can capture packets. Okay, so ephemeral containers are cool and all, but it doesn't help us get around this core issue of not being able to set a different security context within an ephemeral container. I have good news. I was kind of lying before. This issue has actually just recently been fixed upstream and will be coming to a kube control debug version, kube control debug command in a future version. Going forward, I hope that we can integrate ephemeral containers into other open source tools like KSNF, a kube control plugin that runs TCP dump and use Wireshark to capture remote, to start remote captures on pods. All right, so for a quick recap. Cool, uh, thanks. Yeah, so Linux uh, doesn't have containers. Uh, it has namespaces. Uh, these isolate certain resources from each other. Uh, the network namespace isolates the network resources. Uh, so when multiple containers run in a pod, they all observe the same network resources. Uh, P tables rewrite the packet headers uh, in order for traffic to be redirected to the proxy. IP tables will rewrite uh, the destination part of the packet header. And then the proxy looks at the socket table. Um, since the destinations on the packets were rewritten by IP tables, the proxy needs to ensure that the original address is used. Um, so we can look that up in the socket table, which has a corresponding entry for the connection. And on the debugging side, TCP observability is extremely limited outside of things like response flags. To capture traffic within a pod, you can use NSN to run the host and run TCP dump on loopback. To capture traffic leaving the pod, you can run TCP on the host, TCP dump on the host against this virtual interface for the pod. And lastly, ephemeral containers are here to save us from all this friction. If this work is interesting to you, or you're passionate about Kubernetes or service meshes, at Airbnb, we're actively hiring. Please go to airbnb.com slash careers to learn more. Cool, and yeah, if you enjoyed the presentation, uh, Buoyant runs a service mesh academy you can sign up for. Uh, these are monthly hands-on workshops for uh, real-world production users, and it is free. And we also work on a service mesh as a service uh, product that manages Linkerd for you on your own clusters. Uh, you can book a demo or come find us at the Buoyant booth. Um, yeah, we'd love to talk. Well, that was a great That's session. It. If you learned something, yes, clap your hands. Thank you, thank you.